Welcome to this week's Red V TV show. As we have a lot to talk about, and it's not necessarily stuff on the pitch, given we're still a couple of weeks off a game. But, Clev, we're plenty of news over the last couple of days, uh, which we'll give a quick roundup on. Yeah, let's get going. First up, the Saints are on the way to Australia. Um, I think they'll have arrived by now. I think we were joking on, on social media to say it probably would have took them longer to get to the airport on the M62, given the closures the other day, um, than it actually did on that flight to Australia. Yeah, it probably did. I'm just mindful that the, the fella there on the left looks like he's packed the same as my missus does for a night away. Looks like he's um, in that bag. <laughs> yeah, maybe, that's how, got... maybe that's how we're getting some of the junior squad members there. <laughs> Just you get in there, you'll fit. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. Uh, yeah, the, the, bet, you, uh... bet your rush is not in a bag. <laughs> First class, no, the plane. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, the, I bet they had a bit of an eventful uh trip to Manchester Airport with um. With the traffic congestion that we experienced the other morning, but hopefully that's the the worst thing they've had to endure uh, on not, the triple. Jeff. It's not because there oh, is, is Wi-Fi. Not? No, there is Wi-Fi on these planes, so they've oh. been forced to endure twenty Red V previews. <laughs> <the players>. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I could just imagine them turning around, going, "Right, it's your turn now, pal. It's your turn." Oh, they've not done me yet, so. <laughs> Um, yeah, if the if anybody's watching this and you're bored in your hotel, Kev's done a really great interview with Mal Meninga, which you may not have seen yet. <laughs> Where for what? Yeah, that is good actually. It's good. Um, obviously we've gone out over there in plenty of time. Um, I think obviously they're gonna have like a good ten days in Australia before that first challenge game against St George. Yep. And it's good to see us taking us seriously and not just turning up three or four days before risking jet lag. Um, we're going at this professionally as we rightly should. Yeah, um, that's it. It'd be easy for us just to rock over the roll up, play a game, and come back. Uh, but because we're part of this extended series and there is money on offer as well for it, um, you've you've got to take it seriously. You've got to go over there. And this is where rugby league sometimes shoots itself in the foot by not taking things as seriously as they should. And this is something that we really, really are doing it the right way by going over to Australia to play, but doing it by going over there earlier than we, we possibly would have in the past, playing against St. George, uh, and then looking forward to the big one against Penrith. And if you tell you what, if you want a, a good pre-season, what better way to do it than in some Australian sunshine as well? It'll obviously benefit us greatly when we get back. Um, they won't be training on concrete cowley pitches um, <laughs> in the ice cold weather. It's, it's going to be nice sunshine and, and really good prep. Yeah, hopefully so. Hopefully they can get a lot of uh, good prep. Um like into him this this next couple of weeks. Obviously, it's going to be a tough one coming back uh, from that game and then turning round into the the cast game. I'd imagine we'll see quite a few changes to that team that turns out against Cass, or a couple of people will be be left out. I would have thought, um, but yeah, listen. <laughs> You've got to go over there and play these teams and and get the kudos of of being in the World Club Championship and and hopefully bring home another one for the uh, that trophy cabinet, which they might have to start extending soon. Absolutely. Um, just highlighted a couple of people in that picture. I think it's Aussies just going home and they've got to have a yellow bobble hat on there to prove how cold it was over here. <laughs> possibly. Possibly. A more to the point. What a tash that is. <laughs> That's it. I should uh, I should just cultivate the task, shouldn't I? Definitely all these. As good as that. Right, that's them done. Right, next up on the agenda, Kev, we have... Nothing at the moment because I've got to turn the annotation off. We have got season tickets. Um, yes. Seen a little bit of chatter um, about season tickets not being ready yet. Um, for collection... 
obviously the club are moving over to Ticketmaster, which in the long run is really going to benefit the club in terms of selling tickets and, and just the organisation behind it. I think you might have the option of being able to choose your seats properly on a proper proper planner. Um, a couple of people wondering why the club aren't releasing a statement. It's because they already have. Um, and the club will contact all 2023 members via email once this process is completed and advise when cards will be ready for collection. Um, we still about 33 days, 32 days away from no, well, maybe 30 days to play playing leads at home. So so long as you get it 20 in about 28 days' time, or have it before then, then there's nothing to worry about because until then, it's a piece of plastic that looks like that on the screen. I I, I probably wouldn't um you've still got your arrows on there as well, by the way, just so just so you're aware. Um I probably wouldn't do what I did a couple of years ago where I um I left it until the day of the first game to pick mine up. <laughs> um just on the basis that I wouldn't lose it then. Um so yeah. I care to unpause so I, would... <laughs> so I wouldn't um I wouldn't recommend leaving it until the day of the game, but I understand that some people might want them if they don't kind of live local or if it's a, a bit of a trek and they don't want to be queuing up on um, on that first date at the ticket office trying to pick a, a season ticket up. But as you say, the club will get in touch with people um, once they're ready. Don't worry about it or try not to worry about it. I'm sure they'll have them ready in enough time. Yeah, and they'll be delivered. Listen, most Premier League football clubs deliver them about five days before. Um, and for me, I'd be quite glad because I'd probably lose it in about four weeks. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, next up. Oh, it's like a roulette reel, isn't it? Yeah. It's the who? Um, obviously, so, um, the who are going to be playing at the Totally Wicked Stadium. Um, Kevin, remind me of the date. Is it July the 19th? I have no idea. <laughs> you you are absolutely <laughs> useless. I know. I, know. Uh, I feel like it is July the nice. 21st. July the 21st it is. Well, I was close. I was close. I was the right week. Um, yeah. Once again, a, a massive coup. Um or coup, whatever the word is, for the town. Uh, Mike Rush doing the business and all the marketing team and management at the club off the field getting, again, a massive piece of revenue into the, into the club, which will benefit us on and off the field for, for the next couple of years. And it's almost like now we've held a successful concert last year and we've shown it can be done and we've got the who this year, it's almost like we are now going to be on that little summer concert venue circuit um, so you can hopefully expect at least one concert every year Yeah, listen, moving into the stadium was part of making it that um, we had 306, or possible 365, 366 some years, days worth of uh, revenue coming in this is a good way to make that big chunk of revenue obviously people may have uh, the only issue that people may have is the state of the pitch after it. Hopefully, we've got enough time for the pitch to be in decent nick um, once it's on. But let's not let that detract too much from Saints doing the business again, being the best run club in Super League, and having events like this on at the stadium and building a portfolio that, as you say, then. We have a range of acts on. The Who won't be to everybody's taste, just like Paul Heaton and Jackie Abbott are to everybody's taste. But next year, it might be somebody that you like. And if as long as they can keep getting the big names on, like they are doing, then it's great for the club. It means we can invest in the club, in the future of the club. Um, and it's, it's great work by all the staff behind the scenes. Yeah, listen, it may not be to everyone's taste, but it'll sell out. And that is the yeah, main thing. Yeah. Um, I seen the who 
um, headline Glastonbury. Um, 2008, I think it was. Um, or was it 2007? One of them years, and they were absolutely amazing. Um, wasn't a massive fan of The Who previously. Diff, my, not my generation. Um, that's not The Who, that's The Rolling Stones. Isn't it? Isn't no. it? Who is it? The Who. Is it? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> See, I'm still not a massive fan, but I've messed up my own fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, they were, they were excellent at Glastonbury. So if you get managed to get tickets, which I'm guessing they're not going to be as cheap as last year, mm -hmm. um, but get yourself down there and watch a legendary band. Right, next, Kevin. He's definitely not my generation. He's about 20 years younger. Yes. Now, we're going to talk about Lewis Murphy only because he was linked um, extensively with Saints to somebody we looked, well, we were looking like we were interested in and we've been potentially rumoured to be signing for 2024. But news emerged overnight that he's going to join the Sydney Roosters um, next year on a two-year deal, um, picking up 90k a year. Probably not treble what he could be offered over here. Has it been confirmed? It's not been confirmed officially Assault. by the Roosters, yeah. but the, the Aussie press and, and some of the British press have picked up on it as well. And I don't think um, some of our esteemed journalists would have run it if they hadn't have probably checked in already and made sure there was a bit of substance behind it. Yeah. Well, that's it. Listen, it, it, you mentioned the, the, the minimum wage that you can earn in the NRL. He's got to make a decision that sets him up there. He can go and live in Sydney, lovely part of the world, move over there, play against the best. And I don't think anybody can blame me for making that decision, if that's the decision that's been made. I know Wakefield have said that it's all speculation so far, or the last that I read was it was all speculation so far, and he was um, contracted to them for this season. But if he is going over to the Ro Roosters, good luck to the lad. It's a shame. I would have liked to have seen him in the Red V, but good luck to him. Is, it, is this just the case of it's going to happen more and more over the next few years? And I know Sam Tompkins was on his Twitter today saying um, it's a no-brainer for these young lads. And for with the amount of money that is swilling around the NRL, they can afford to take flyers on our best youngsters, um, 90k a year, Um to an Australian side is is short change if the player turns out to be world class. If it doesn't, it's just a, a flyer. It, it it sounds awful, but it's about the equivalent of Saints taking a flyer on T Ritson. If it works yeah. out great, if it doesn't, it doesn't. And it's the same in this way. And listen, if Lewis doesn't make it the NRL, he'll come back and, and wow Super League, I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. It lad's got talent, hasn't he? He's got talent, he's got pace to burn, he's just got that that raw ability. He just he's someone who, who gets bums off seats. Uh, as Sam Tompkins says, listen, it's in it it's gonna happen more and more. Whether that means we need to do something about the salary cap, the only problem is there's no money in the sport over here. You need to improve that before you can start thinking of up in the salary cap. Otherwise, clubs will go chasing the dream. We'll end up with Bradford's and the likes again. I'll say witness, even though it wasn't necessarily witness's fault. It was um, more... Somebody will be no, names. We'll yeah, we'll go down that route. Um, but you're gonna, you, you'll are you end up with, with teams like that who are just chasing, trying to stay in Super League or trying to be part of an expanded Super League or even a contracted one if we go down to 10 teams. It's not that I'm against it. It's just got to be done at the right time and for the right reasons rather than just going, oh, my God, we've got to do something. We have, but it's got to be done right. I think the issue is, I think there's only about three or four clubs that are actually spending up to the cap as it is. Um, yeah. And you feel like those clubs, Saints being one of them, get held back a little bit. Um but you, when you've got half the league who aren't spending to cap, uh, the, the game's got issues. And, and hopefully IMG come in uh, and look at the financial streams and try and improve them somewhat. Yeah, definitely. Because then if we can start getting the cap up, 
and keeping players like him in the game, then great. I don't agree that all of our best youngsters should be going over to Australia because all you're doing there is saying, let's improve the Aussie sides. I know you're improving them as well, but all you're doing is saying, let's improve the Aussie sides. Why would people stay and watch lesser players if all your best players went out and there's no real talent? Why would you stay watching rugby league? Yeah. You need that mix of your good youth coming through, your established players, your overseas stars, like the same squad currently is. You need all them to make people come and watch the game. Agreed. Right, next up, Kevin. Um, the HIA is being increased to 12 days next season. And I think I, I put on, or we put on our social media earlier. Um, that could mean if you suffer a HIA playing in a Sunday fixture, not only will you miss the game the following week, you will miss the game the week after if it's played on a Friday because that would be day 12 under the protocol. Fair enough. Um, Fair enough. I can, I, I can understand why club... Why, listen, I've got no issue with players taking the right amount of time off the field that they need um, for the gradual return to play and it being 12 days, that's absolutely fine. But in that case then, our Sunday fixture is going to be a thing of the past. Our game's going to be seven days apart, so players won't miss more than one. Because it, it could it, it could impact teams you play on a Sunday more than most. Yeah. Especially, like, that's it. You, you turn around and we'll mention Wakey. Wakey, you traditionally play on a Sunday, and then you've got to come over to us in a couple of weeks' time and we play on a Friday. Yeah, it, it's going to affect them. Listen, I think it's the right thing to do. Because there are so many, we don't want to sanitise the game, but the culture needs to change from just winning at all costs to a health culture. Um, I'm then going to caveat that with, if you're going to do that, you need to make sure your big games are spread apart to give people the chance to play in them. Yeah. So your grand final needs to be that many days apart from your semi-final because otherwise I'm not saying I don't want to go down the routes of oh you're, you're making sure that people miss it because they're missing it for the right reasons but I go back to we pay money to watch games with the best players on the field if that means here's that here's a question for you Kev go on. should head guards be made mandatory <sighs> Is that That's a whole show yeah, I think so. I think so because you can argue both ways. It depends on the. It's pre to me, prevent it, prevention it, is surely better than the cure. Yeah, but it depends almost how much oh, no. they yeah. prevent. It it prevent it, how much do they prevent it? I suppose you. We there's a whole show in this because you could go down the rugby union thing of making sure that all high tackles, not the community one where they, they were on about tackling below the waist and up below the waist only, but tackles are, I think it's armpit. Anything above that is is high. If you went down that route, are you sanitising the game? No, because you can still hit up here. That's absolutely fine. But you're taking out the chance, and it's a learned culture, the chance of getting anyone up high and then there's bigger penalties for doing it because you've got to have that duty of care to your opponent. That said, I also saw one from the NRL physio, I think it was, where a player had ducked into the tackle. The tackler had obviously hit a high because she's ducked in, but the tackler got 10 minutes. And it should have been a case of, well, they both got a duty of care. The tackler can do nothing about it. So you, it's got to be a sensible discussion and common sense reasons for A bands and B decisions like making high tackles a little bit lower, um, making head guards mandatory, they've got to be real good reasons for them and real. I want to see proper studies into it, not just knee jerk reactions. Kev, you win the soapbox award of the evening. Thank you very much. Um, 
Clubs will now be permitted to name a fifth interchange player on the bench if you suffer three HIAs in the same match. Don't know how many times you're going to see that on the field, but hey ho, it's a start, isn't it? Um, and the protocols it, it around the, the protocols around the green card, which was introduced in 22, have been reinforced. And when they say reinforced, do they mean they're actually going to use it? Because they didn't last year, really, did they? Well, that's it. Going back to the fifth interchange, I'd probably drop that to two players fa failing the HIA. Um, and with regards to the green card, listen, it's a great idea because it then means that your player who's who's injured gets the right medical treatment off the field. We can get on with the game and they can get treated. And if they're swinging the lead, then they get off the game and... You, the club's got two minutes without them. So it, yeah. it not only does it look after players, it also benefits the game for people who are, and I'll use the word, cheating. And there's a certain couple of players we know who do that. Right. And the last one, Kev, the third law change concerns penalties awarded at scrums, which will no longer be differential penalties as previously, meaning that the non-offending team will be able to kick for goal. Okay, fine. We, I, I seem to, I seem to think that it's we just have tweak a law for tweaking a law's sake. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I'd rather I want to see law changes that a don't sanitize the game but look after players, and b make the game easier to understand, so your new fans who come along can just pick up the game without having to have some kind of degree in mathematics because they're looking at different offsides or sliders or little technicalities. Make it easy. The rule that should have changed, which hasn't, should have been, if you get a, instead of a six again on the first couple of tackles in your own 30, you can kick for touch. It should be a proper penalty rather than six again. Correct. Don't know why they've not done it, but hopefully we'll see it at some point in the future. Right, Kev, that was the whistle stop, stop tour. On the red VV. <laughs> that was the whistle stop tour on the red V TV show. This is pre season, Kevin. This is when you iron out all you, you get your match fitness now, Dave. You get your match fitness, you iron out all the, the little flaws, and then you hit it first week in. Boom. That's the plan. Absolutely. Indeed. Talking about iron, and I probably could do iron at its top, but there we go. Right. Yeah. Um. See you again next week for another rant, and we'll, and we'll probably do a bit of a preview ahead of the Battle of the Red V. And it's yeah. not me, but you. No. Nope. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll catch you next week for Red V TV. Unless you're watching the previews every day, like the players on the plane.